If you're looking to start making some knives but the heat treats got you scared, then you've come to the right place. Because today, we're going to go over the basics of heat treating and then also go over the most forgiving steel to start off with. All that, coming up. Alright guys, let's get started. So I want to give a major shout out before we get started to Stacy at Blade Forms. He's a moderator in the shop talk section. Uh, he helped me proofread these notes so that I made sure to get everything in here. And also, uh, he's a wealth of information, so go check him out over there at Bladeforms in the Shop Talk section. Uh, also, I want to point out that I have notes. I'll be looking at these a lot, so don't judge me too hard. Uh, there's a lot of details here that I want to make sure to convey in this video. And then thirdly, on the housekeeping, I know there are a lot of opinions with heat treating. Uh, a lot of people do things differently. So go ahead and put those in the comments if you have any comments about uh, how this video went or if there's some things you weren't expecting or things that you do differently that works for you. So make sure to put those in the comment section below. So first we're going to go over some of the basic terms in heat treating and then later in the video we're going to go over the heat treating of a knife from start to finish and then we're going to talk about uh, what the best steel is for a new knife maker and I'll give you a little spoiler alert it's 1080 1084. We're going to go uh, step by step on heat treating a 1080 knife. So first let's go over some terms. The first term we're going to talk about today is normalizing. So what normalizing does is it basically just takes the stress out of your blade and removes a undesirable coarse grain structure from your blade. To normalize generally you will heat your blade up to around 300 to 500 degrees above your critical temperature. The critical temperature is where your blade goes non-magnetic. So it's around 1333 degrees Fahrenheit. So the goal here is to heat your blade up and then let it cool in room temperature uh, down to room temperature and still air. Uh, you don't want to induce any speed to the cooling like behind a fan or something like that. So what this does is it takes the stress out of your blade. Uh, I still do this as a stock removal knife maker for the most part. I know that uh, guys who forge definitely need to do this. Uh, while we're talking about normalizing, we'll touch base on annealing. It's kind of similar. Uh, what you're doing with annealing is you're heating up the blade to around 75 degrees above critical and then you're letting it cool slowly uh, with your forge overnight or over an extended period of time. What this does is it makes the blade extremely soft and easy to work with and grind and drill and things of that nature. Uh, the next term we're going to talk about is the quench. So this is the sexy part that you get to see on TV. Everybody's quenching your hot blade in oil and you see a big fireball. Uh, so the quench, what it does is it takes your blade from a target temperature, which is generally a couple hundred degrees above critical temperature, and then brings it down to room temperature very fast via a quenching media like oil or water or brine. Uh, so that's the quench. Uh, right here is a blade that I quenched. This is a test knife. It's an old attempt that failed miserably. Uh, but here is a blade that I quenched in oil, and you can see that it doesn't flex very well. It will immediately break. It's super hard. It is skate of file, really easy, but if you put any rotational force on it, it will snap quickly. So you got a hard, brittle blade. So to get your blade to a usable knife, you have to temper it, and that's the next step. So with tempering, what you're doing is you're taking some of the heat, I'm sorry, some of the hardness out of your quenched blade, and you're making it more tough, more durable, more flexible. And these are qualities that are required in a knife because knives are hard use items. You have people chopping with them, batoning, uh, you, you hit bones. If you're skinning, you don't want your edge to chip. So to make your blade more durable, you have to temper it. And to temper it, you basically bake your, uh, your knife at a uh, much lower degrees Fahrenheit than the critical temperature. So we're talking 350, 400 degrees Fahrenheit, that kind of range. So take a look at this test blade after I've tempered it. The same blade I put in the tempering oven for two cycles at 410 degrees Fahrenheit and you can see that it has way more flex in it before it fails. So this is what we're going for here. Now that we've gone over the terms involved with heat treating, uh, let's talk briefly about 1080. So for the sake of simplicity, when I mention 1080, I am talking about 1080 and 1084 because they are pretty much identical when it comes to heat treating them uh, for all practical purposes. Uh, so when I say 1080, I mean 1080 and 1084 going forward. Different suppliers will carry them based on availability. 
If I had to choose one, I'd generally choose 1084 because there are some slight advantages of 1084. But one of the best things about 1084 and why it is recommended for new knife makers is because 1080 can be heat treated effectively in a home forge setup. You don't need expensive heat treating ovens. You can get a pretty darn good heat treat, a very forgiving heat treat on 1080, 1084. You don't require any soak times is probably the biggest part. So step one, we're gonna go through the process of heat treating a knife. So step one is normalizing. So we're gonna take this blade up uh, and do two normalizing cycles with the third normalizing cycle quenching. So look into blade forms, the best practices for normalizing 1080 is to first bring it up to around 1800 degrees Fahrenheit and then letting it cool to room temperature. Second, bringing it up to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, letting it cool to room temperature. And third, bringing it up to your target quench temperature, which is 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, and then quenching it. So how do we get these good temperatures? You know, if you had a lot of money, you could buy a heat treating oven and nail each one of these temperatures perfectly. If you don't have a lot of money, you can try to do this in your forge, and that's what we're gonna be doing today. So the method that I would advise to new makers to, to get up to these temperatures in your forge is the magnet and eye method. So the magnet will tell you when you reach the critical temperature, which is around 1,333 degrees Fahrenheit. Then you can utilize your eye and the color of the steel to kind of judge where you get to 1,800, 1,600, and 1,500. Uh, so this is not going to be an exact science, but with experience, you'll get closer and closer. I'll make sure to put up a uh, color guide here to give you an idea. Uh, one tip on this strategy is to kind of have the lights lower in your shop at this point so you can actually see what's going on. If you're heat treating out in the sun, uh, this can be very difficult for you. So here I am getting my blade up to non-magnetic. I'm then leaving it in there for about 10 more seconds until I get it up to what I judge is 1800 degrees Fahrenheit and then I let that blade cool to room temperature. I do this again at 16, and on the third cycle, I get it up to 1500 degrees and quench it in canola oil. So we're gonna talk briefly right now about the quench oil. Uh, I quench in 120 to 130 degree uh, quench oil, and it's uh, for me, it's canola oil. If you are gonna do this perfectly, you would utilize a fast quenching oil like Parks 50, uh, but canola oil will do, especially if you're only gonna be making a couple of knives or if you're new or cheap. Uh, but the canola oil, I'll heat it up to 120 with a hot piece of rebar, and then I'll use a temp gun to gauge how hot that oil is. If I get it too hot, or if you're quenching multiple blades that day, go ahead and use a cold piece of rebar to cool it back down. Also note that you probably wanna use a gallon or more of quench oil. If you use too little, the whole system will get too hot too fast, and your blade won't be effectively hardened, or not as hard as it could be. Also make sure you're using a non-flammable container, generally a steel container or metal, uh, so that A, you don't push a hot blade through like a plastic container, and, and B, in case it catches on fire, it won't uh, melt down on you. Also make sure you have a lid so you can uh, throw that lid on there if it does catch fire, and for storage so your oil doesn't get contaminated with water or something along those lines. Uh, make sure when you quench, as you see here, I'm putting the blade directly into the oil, and then I'll move with an in and out motion or an up and down along the spine uh, edge axis. Don't move from side to side because this will increase the chances of warpage. If you wanna get fancy, you can pull the blade out after seven to eight minutes and then try to flex out your warp, but note with gloved hands, but note that after you get below 400 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, stop messing with it because the chances of you snapping your blade go up substantially. But don't worry, you can always get that warp out later on. And we'll talk about that in a second. So after the blade has cooled, go ahead, put in your vise and test it with a file. Your file should not be able to cut into the blade. However, uh, a lot of times you'll have a little layer of decarb that your file will cut into. So get through that level of decarb and then you'll get to a hard blade that your file can't cut into. Another side note on the decarb is if you're bringing your blade to 100% completion, that could be a problem considering that the decarb will be on the surface of your steel. So before you heat treat, bring your blade maybe to 80 or 90% so that you still have some meat to grind away after your heat treating process and get through that layer of decarb and get it off of your blade because it's very undesirable to have soft steel on the surface of your knife. Uh, lastly, we're gonna temper the blade. Uh, while I was heating up the forge, I went ahead and started my tempering oven. 
My oven is a PID control tempering oven, and I have a sweet video right here on how to wire up your own. But uh, what it does is it allows you to hold a very precise temperature, in my case around three degrees plus or minus to my set point. Uh, so I don't run the risk of uh, overheating the blade and making it softer than it should be. If you don't have a PID control toaster oven, just a normal toaster oven or a, a range oven in your kitchen will work fine. Just be very careful with those that they, you don't overshoot your temperature. And also uh, make sure you preheat them because they ramp up really hard a lot of times, come down and they hover around the set point. You can get a really cheap thermometer to kind of monitor this and kind of feel out where your oven generally levels off. Um, and also you, could, uh, you can temper at lower temperatures and then try to do like a flex test and see how it landed. And then you can up your tempering your temperatures as you go if you have an oven that's uh, non-precise and you're trying to figure out what to do. So we're gonna do two tempering cycles here. We'll do the first cycle at 410 degrees Fahrenheit for two hours. Then we'll take the blade out and we'll put the blade into uh, cold or room temperature water to get it back to room temperature quickly. And then we'll dry it off, put it back in the oven, do another tempering cycle for two hours at 410 degrees Fahrenheit, then dunk it in water after that and you're done. You now have a tempered, uh, usable, flexible, durable blade made out of 1080. So also note that the dunking in water doesn't do anything other than speed up the time. There could be a slight benefit, but it's mostly just a time saver and it doesn't hurt your blade at all. So that's the process for heat treating 1080. 1080 by far is the most uh, forgiving steel for a new knife maker because you don't have to soak it and you can heat treat it in your home forge. It's very forgiving. If you wanna use more exotic steels, it's no big deal, use them, but make sure that you send them off to a professional for heat treating so that you don't uh, come out with bad products trying to heat treat those in your forge. So stuff like stainlesses and D2, A2, stuff like that. So I hope you guys really enjoyed this video. Uh, I wanted to make it quick and to the point so that new makers can kind of get into the game. But that is how you heat treat 1080. If you like this video, go ahead and hit the like button below. Also, please subscribe to the channel for more fun content that's related to knife making coming up. I also have some tool reviews coming up so that should be fun for you guys. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel for all that and uh, hit some comments down and tell me how you like this video in the comment section below. So with all that, um, I'll catch you guys on the flip side. Actually, um, my wife hates it when I say that, so I'll catch y'all on the flip side. Because I'm not a Yankee.